Well, open your Bible this morning to the second chapter of Luke's Gospel. Um, Many of you were not here during Jeff's Bible study, and you really missed out. Uh, he, He spoke on the transfiguration from the ninth chapter of Luke's Gospel. But just to give you a little bit of background for those that haven't heard, what, what you are hearing from the pulpit today, you can send Dr. Sinclair Ferguson a thank you card or hate mail um, because it is providentially his assignment that we are declaring to you. We had the benefit, we as in myself, Jeff, Allen, and Mac, we had the benefit of being able to sit under Dr. Ferguson all day Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and as well as tomorrow, and had the additional uh, treat of being able to preach to him and the rest of the pastors and seminarians there in the class at Reformed Theological Seminary. And it's been a joy. I told Amber I felt like this was the last of my birthday presents. So we have thoroughly enjoyed the time. And the text that was assigned to me, really the topic, he didn't assign texts, he assigned topics all of which encompass preaching Christ in the Gospels. The assignment that I received was Jesus, the boy of 12. And I saw that and I thought to myself, this is going to be fun. (laughs) And it has been. So, our text in Luke 2, I will read it in a moment, but to introduce the theme, I want to make a few comments. It's not at all uncommon for admirers of great men to wonder about the childhood experiences of those great men. We could all share different childhood stories of men or women that we admire in the faith or out of the faith. Uh, They are of great interest to us. Those we admire, even uphold as heroes, they fascinate us. And we would eagerly hear a story about an instance from their childhood years. Documentary films of famous individuals almost always start in the childhood years, if you haven't noticed. They, They don't just pick up the story with what made that individual famous. They begin in the beginning. And the childhood stories of notable individuals so often stand out to us as even foreshadowing the accomplishments that will come later in life. It's rather profound at times. For example, George Washington was mentioned right down here this morning. And if you were to ask someone about memorable stories from the life of George Washington, it is likely they would include the story of him cutting down his father's cherry tree as a child. That may be one of the most remembered stories. Oddly enough, it's likely not even true. But whether it's fact or fiction, it shows that these childhood stories, at least in the framework of how we view an individual, they serve as building blocks of sorts for the foundation of that individual's life and what follows. Right? For George Washington, he was known as an honest man because he confessed that deed to his father. And then we come to consider the Lord Jesus Christ. There is almost nothing that we know about Jesus from the first 30 years of his life. Apocryphal literature, this would be literature from the days of the early church, the first two, three, four centuries of the early church. Apocryphal literature, not in the canon of Scripture, oftentimes driven by Gnostic and or other heresies, has creatively tried to fill in some gaps for us in Jesus' childhood days. We have documents like the infancy gospel of Thomas, which tells a story of Jesus at age five. And all the ears perk up. It's just not true. But they tell the story of age five where Jesus is playing in a brook and and out of the wet sand, essentially clay, he forms these 12 sparrows with his hands and then he sets them there and he claps. And the sparrows take on life 
and they flutter away, chirping as they go. But again, stories like this are fictional, oftentimes rather silly, but they are all birthed by a desire to paint a picture of the childhood years of our Lord. I mean, wouldn't you love to have in our Bible stories of Jesus as a five-year-old boy? Jesus as a teenager? Jesus as a young carpenter? Jesus as the eldest brother in that household? This is something that probably every Christian wishes to know. But it isn't something God determined to give us. So, when we turn to the last 14 verses of Luke chapter 2, we read them with deep appreciation, as this is the only childhood story of our Savior that we possess. And it is only found in Luke chapter 2. None of the other gospel writers include this particular detail. So, let's read this account with awe and admiration. This is the Word of God. Luke chapter 2, picking up in verse 39. And when they, that would be Joseph and Mary, had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned into Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom. And the favor of God was upon him. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up according to custom. And when the feast was ended, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents did not know it, but supposing him to be in the group, they went a day's journey. But then they began to search for him among their relatives and acquaintances. And when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem, searching for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. And he said to them, Why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? And they did not understand the saying that he spoke to them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. And his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. May God bless the reading of his word. Let me pray. Father, this is the Holy Bible, the sacred and inspired text, the God-breathed book from heaven. And I pray that you would speak to us from this book today that the Holy Spirit would have tremendous freedom amongst us, that the invisible hand of God would work, that you would feed us with food that is needful, that produces life everlasting in us. O Lord, be honored by your word and what is preached today. Help us to have ears to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. I have divided the sermon this morning into three parts, which will just follow along with Luke's 
narrative, these 14 verses that we have read. I want you to see the passage before us today in three parts. Number one, the humanity of Jesus. Number two, the hunger of Jesus. And number three, the humility of Jesus. And you have to keep in mind this. Are you listening? Keep this in mind. All that we are reading today is of the boy, Jesus, at 12 years of age. Don't forget it. Don't lose sight of it. So for starters, the humanity of Jesus. We pick up in verse 39 and 40. We have the culmination of what scholars refer to as the infancy narrative, the the few things really that we know of Jesus in the first days, weeks, months of his life, the infancy narrative. And then when we come to the end of verse 40, we essentially hit a period of silence which lasts for 12 years. That's the gap between verse 40 and verse 41. 12 years of silence. You want to know what Jesus did at six? Nope. You'll have to learn in heaven because we don't have that kind of information in the Bible. So then... Verse 41 introduces to us the only narrative text we have of the childhood years of our Savior. The only other narrative text we have until his public ministry begins at the age of 30. You can do the math, can't you? That's another long period of silence. But what a choice selection the Holy Spirit through the pen of this man, Luke, that we have. What a choice selection from the life of the boy, Jesus, that God did choose to give us in our Bible. The story picks up in verse 41 now with the devout parents of our Lord heading up once more to Jerusalem for the annual Passover feast. And how encouraging it is to see Joseph and Mary who were so consistent in making this journey of nearly 80 miles from their town of Nazareth. No Uber, no taxis. They're making this journey most likely on foot amidst a large group of Jews. They're making the trek as what we would call a caravan. And this trek took three to four days, one way. This was a big commitment for a family that probably had little expendable income. To travel to Jerusalem for the Passover feast likely meant two weeks or so of time away from chores, animals, carpentry. On top of that, at this point in Israel's history, the women were not even required to make the trip. And yet we see Joseph and Mary, hand in hand, journeying to Jerusalem together. You see, these parents of our Lord were faithful. They were devoted to God. Year in and year out, they go to Jerusalem to worship. And here in our text, we see that this year, we don't know if it was the first time ever or if it was one of many times, but we see that this particular year, Jesus goes with them as a 12-year-old boy. This is an interesting detail. Because it was at 13 that a Jewish boy really becomes a man. Um, He would be called a son of the commandment. He would have now full rights and participation in the life of a synagogue. It's what is now referred to amongst Jewish families as bar mitzvah. And it seems that this trip, Jesus being only 12 years old, is, is somewhat preparatory. But as we will see, 
it ends up being far more preparatory than mom and dad knew. So the family worships in Jerusalem. They enjoy the blessed fellowship with their friends, family, and neighbors during the Passover celebration and the feast days which followed. And now it is time for the return journey home. Off they go, but not all of them. The 12 year old Jesus stays behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and Mary don't know it. As the caravan travels north, down the mountains of Jerusalem toward Nazareth, it seems likely that Joseph and Mary both were assuming that Jesus was with them somewhere in that group of friends, relatives, and neighbors. And in a large caravan like that, it would be easy for parents to trust that their children were with others who could be trusted. I mean, how do you not trust Jesus? He's a good boy. Surely he's with someone and it's okay. But that night they come to the first pit stop. They're gonna spend the night somewhere in that wilderness and it was only then that mom and dad realize Jesus is not with them. Have you seen Jesus, Joseph says to Mary? No, I thought he was with you the whole time. Joseph says, the last time I saw him was at the souvenir shop outside the gates of the city. So back to Jerusalem, they go. And it's really not comical, is it? The text says they were greatly distressed. And we can understand that. Parents can understand that. What parent has not experienced the temporary lostness of a child? even if it was for seconds. What boy has not wandered off causing his parents this kind of great distress? But think of the agony that Joseph and Mary felt in that moment when they come to the realization that Jesus is not with them. They didn't lose him in a grocery store to where they can just walk a few aisles down, quickly catch him. He was now a day's journey away somewhere. It would be at least 24 hours before they could even begin to look for him in the city. Recall what Simeon had spoken to Mary when Jesus was presented in the temple and prophetically he speaks to Mary saying that a sword is going to pierce through her own soul. Mary could be thinking in this moment, is this the sword? I mean, it's that kind of distress. Was that the last time I see my son? Distress, grief, fear, desperation. I think we need to realize these weren't super parents. They were parents just like you and me. They were feeling these things just like you and I would feel them. And after a total period of three days, a day out, a day back, and I guess about a day searching within the walls of Jerusalem, after a total period of about three days, they finally find him. All right. Up to this point in the narrative, everything's really normal, isn't it? I mean, there's, there's some drama, no doubt, potentially tragic drama, but this is all relatively common. This early portion of Luke's narrative with the family's journey to Jerusalem and the parents fretting over the lost child, all of this is typical. This happens in American homes today. Today it will happen that a parent will experience this, go looking for that child, find them, have all the emotion attached to that. I want you to remember the text is showing us something about Jesus as a boy, not just about mom and dad. These events surrounding this picture being painted, it, it's all so typical. But I want you now to turn your attention to that boy of 12. According to verse 40, that, that 
ending of the infancy narrative, we see that the child grew, that he gained muscle mass. That sounds ordinary enough, doesn't it? I think I've gained some girth, some muscle mass. As Jesus aged, his mental capacity and his ability to reason, it was all increasing. He, he, he was filled, says the ESV with wisdom, the, the actual Greek verb, he was being filled, a continual being filled with wisdom. All, all of this really drives home the reality of the humanity of Jesus. I want you to see the normalcy of these events. Yes, Jesus grew in wisdom. Can you handle that? It's telling us something about his humanity, his human nature. You see, the early life of the Lord was altogether like ours, except without sin. His days were filled with normal, routine events like chores, the care of siblings, shopping, and so on. Very routine. In the home, he had a mom, a dad, brothers, and sisters. We learn that elsewhere in the Gospels. He had animals to train and to care for. He was tired at the end of a long day. As the eldest son, by the age of 12, he was already beginning to learn his father's trade of carpentry. All of this seems so normal, doesn't it? Except for the absence of sin, this is an ordinary boy living an ordinary life in the context of an ordinary family in an ordinary town of Nazareth. Nothing spectacular about it. All so normal, except for the absence of sin. And let's consider that fact for a moment. Can you imagine how a 12-year-old boy, children, listen, can you imagine how a peer of yours, 12 years old, would blossom as an individual without the hindrances of sin in his thinking, in his emotions, in his desires, in his decisions? Can you imagine that? No sin? How a child would develop in their learning? The bookend statements in our text, verses 40 and 52, they emphasize this kind of remarkable growth. In verse 40, we see the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. And then in verse 52, the other bookend statement, Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. Here was a life unhindered, by internal corruption. No bitterness, no selfishness. Can you imagine a child with no selfishness? No fights over whose toy it is. No pride, no lust. This was a life saturated with love to God every moment of every day, and yet here was a life so normal. Pure, perfect, but normal. What insight the text gives us, Jesus, the boy of 12, and his humanity. He is truly man, and he is truly God. I so appreciate that Jeff was able to speak this morning on the transfiguration, drawing out in spectacular ways the divinity of Jesus Christ. And here in our text, we see his humanity. Spurgeon says it like this, he is not humanity deified. He is not Godhead humanized. He is God, he is man. He is all that God is and all that man is as God created him. Never forget that the divine and eternal son took on flesh in order to save us. He became one of us. 
Never forget that the divine son, then clothed in humanity, grew up from infancy into adulthood, experiencing those different stages of life just like you and I do. Here is one that can perfectly serve as a high priest. Here is one who really understands us. Now, I want to move toward the climax of the narrative. A climax which I think is summarized in two phrases, your father and my father. So secondly, let's look at the hunger of Jesus. It's in this next portion of text that we, we really see what Jesus as a 12-year-old boy hungered for. So back to the narrative we go. Jesus, 12 years old, he's sitting in the temple amongst the teachers and he's fully engaged with them. We see Jesus listening, asking questions, and even answering questions the teachers asked him. This was the common way of instruction and discipleship in that day, the asking and answering of questions. Joseph and Mary, maybe having searched all over Jerusalem, finally come to the temple and they see their son sitting there in dialogue with these teachers and the text tells us they were astonished. Quite a mixture of emotions they must have been feeling. All those hearing Jesus and the answers he was giving, they were amazed and astonished, the text tells us. And Mary, in a flurry of emotions, seeing her son for the first time in three days, she says, son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been looking for you in great distress. There is a rebuke in what Mary expresses. There is obvious frustration. Parents can relate to this kind of response, can't we? But it is a misplaced rebuke. And we see this in Jesus' response. He looks at mom and dad and he says, Why were you looking for me? Did you not know I must be in my father's house? Had Mary forgotten her Magnificat? Had she forgotten what Simeon declared, prophesying over this baby boy, Jesus, as he held him in his hands, when he said, God, you can take me home now, for my eyes have seen your salvation. She hadn't forgotten. Luke (laughs) takes pains to make sure that we know Mary is treasuring up these things in her heart. And yet, She's a mother. Uh, At times prone to worry and to fear, engulfed in great distress ever since learning that Jesus was lost. And I want you to notice something in what Mary says in that moment. Your father and I have been searching for you. She's emphasizing in all of her emotion and passion, she's emphasizing the visible familial relationship and the distress that the two of them felt as loving, concerned parents. And Jesus responds and says, why were you looking for me? Your father and I were searching for you. Jesus says, did you not know I must be in my father's house? He moved, you see, from your father to my father. And these are the very first 
recorded words we have of Jesus in the Bible. I had never even thought about that until this week, preparing for this sermon. The very first words from his lips. Did you not know I must be in my father's house? He's 12 years old, saints. Jesus is saying that his father in heaven has precedence over the closest family ties on earth. God as his father comes first. And this being in his father's house is something he must do. That's what the text says. The Greek word is saying this is absolutely necessary that I be in my father's house. Did you not know? This brief exchange between mother and son is remarkable. And again, I want you to remember, he's only 12 years old here. And from 12 years old, we see Jesus recognized the special relationship he had with his father in heaven. In the Old Testament, we at times see the Old Testament saints referring to the God of my father. There's even a rare mention two times in Isaiah of our father. But Jesus comes on the scene and again and again and again he is referring to God as my father. This kind of intimate talk was brand new. No one had ever said anything like this before. My father. Father. It quickly becomes clear as you read through the Gospels that Jesus knows and relates to the Father in a unique way. The way that only the only Son from the Father, the only begotten of the Father, could. What Ethan the Ezraite said in Psalm 89 is being borne out in the life of Christ. Psalm 89, verse 26, saying, He shall cry to me. You are my Father, my God, the rock of my salvation. Even Luke records Jesus' own testimony during his ministry when Jesus publicly prays to his Father in Luke 10, and he says, All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows who the Son is except the Father, or who the Father is except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Intimate language, intimate knowing. Yes, there is a very special knowing of the Father that Jesus already enjoys at the age of 12. But it also becomes clear that even at 12 years old, Jesus has a singular focus to do his Father's will. Surely ties into the message I preached Two weeks ago today, my food is to do the will of my Father. We read in Psalm 40, verses 7 and 8, Behold, I have come in the scroll of the book. It is written of me. I delight to do your will. O my God, your law is within my heart. This perfectly fulfilled and pictured for us in the life of Jesus. As a boy, Jesus realized and recognized something that he must be about. He must be in his father's house. It was absolutely necessary. Daryl Bach, a commentator on Luke's gospel, said, people will struggle to understand Jesus' task and person. We'll look at that more in a moment. What is clear is that Jesus does not struggle to know either God or his own mission. He has clarity. The 12-year-old boy has clarity. 
As Jesus grows in wisdom and stature and favor, he was growing all these years in his understanding of his relationship with his father and the mission his father had given him. At this early age, in this single account, the door to the desires of the boy Jesus' heart is open to us. And we open that door, we peer in, and we see a young heart aflame with love to God and utter submission to his Father's will. This is a mission, a divine mandate that supersedes even the closest earthly ties, even that of Joseph and Mary. This is clearly drawn out in that contrast. Mary on one hand saying, your father. Jesus saying, I must be in my father's house. And Luke's gospel is full of these I must kind of statements. Luke 4, 43, Jesus must preach. Luke 9, 22, he must suffer. Luke 13, 33, he must go on his way. Luke 19, verse 5, he must stay at Zacchaeus' house. And finally, Luke twenty two thirty seven, he must die as the scriptures had foretold. Jesus sums up the divine imperative well, his own words in John's gospel, for I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. The hunger of his heart compelled him to be in his father's house at this early age. I want to pause for a moment. Will all the 12 year olds wave at me? Got one, Hannah. Okay, two, three, Priscilla. All right, Stephen. Is that three, just three? Okay. I, I won't embarrass you three other than naming you publicly in an audience of 170 people. I won't ask you to stand up, however. But children, you, you know these, don't you? Benjamin, you know these, don't you? Levi, you know these kids, don't you? You see, these, these are 12-year-olds in our midst. And, and I just want to take a moment to speak to you, dear children. Are you looking at me? Jesus, at the age of 12, children, he's so attractive uh, he, he's a boy like no other boy. He, he's likable. Uh, he's obedient. Really, he, he's inspiring. To hear a 12-year-old boy say, I must be in my father's house, that is unique and inspiring. Have you, children, ever thought about Jesus as a 12-year-old boy? Stephen, you ever thought about that? It's your age, 12 years old. You see, Jesus set aside his infinite power and became a man. He became a boy, right? You, you gotta be a boy before you can be a man. He, he had to become like us children in order to save us. And so his childhood years, Stephen, Hannah, Priscilla, they, they're remarkable, not because he displayed his power, but because he didn't. He lived as a young child, loving his father in heaven, just like you can, Hannah. He, he lived as one desiring to please God in everything he did, just like you can, Priscilla. Priscilla. He lived unselfishly by the power of the Holy Spirit just like every other believing boy and girl can. You hear me, Stephen? You have access, children, to the same gospel, to the same Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit that is promised to every young believing heart. You, dear child, can walk with Jesus just like Jesus 
walked near his father. You can love God with your heart just like Jesus did. So whether you're five years old or 85 years old, consider the life of the boy Jesus and long for this kind of hunger yourself. Before we move on, children and adults alike, ask yourself these questions. Am I compelled by love for God to be in his house, to be about his business? And secondly, what am I really hungering for? With Jesus, it is clear what he hungered for. 12-year-old boys, minus parents, 72 hours, all sorts of nonsense can happen. But Jesus must be in his father's house. We shouldn't ever be scared to ask ourselves difficult questions like that, should we? To, to, to honestly deal internally with the question, what am I really hungry for? We shouldn't be afraid of asking. We shouldn't be afraid of answering. We can only win in this scenario. You can only gain from being honest with yourself, children. Thirdly, we see the humility of Jesus. It's the final verses of this passage, the last three, 50 through 52, where I think we see his humility. And I am so thankful for these last three verses. They are precious to me now. In verse 50, we note that mom and dad didn't understand what Jesus was saying. The words themselves were clear enough, but the meaning of those words, the, the weightiness was something that they didn't grasp. Even mom and dad, those who knew him best. And this is something that Jesus would have to bear with all of his life. Nobody really understood him. Not even mom and dad. And can you imagine how difficult that must have been? To never be understood, even by those closest to you? I actually felt this week such sympathy for my Lord. As a misunderstood boy who grew up as a rejected man. And then I realized that some of that same blindness, some degree of it anyways, clings to me. I don't fully understand who he is. So with this in mind, the fact that Mary and Joseph don't understand, how did Jesus respond to his parents? He didn't respond harshly. He didn't criticize them or question their spirituality. He lovingly, submissively picks up his belongings and heads home with them to Nazareth. That's what he did. He goes to Nazareth as a perfectly submissive son and it'll be another 18 years before we see him again in the Gospels. 18 years. According to the text, Mary's treasuring up these events as well as the events surrounding the next 18 years of the life of this child, all in her heart. And all the while, Jesus keeps growing in wisdom, in stature, and in favor with God and man. Here we have the Son of God, the Savior of the world, who lived in almost total obscurity for 30 years. Hardly anyone knew him outside of that little village called Nazareth. The multitudes aren't talking about Jesus around the dinner table. Not yet. He lived like any other common Jew in his day. And he did so without complaint and without jealousy. He did so with perfect joy and perfect Submission. We don't want what we consider our giftedness to go unnoticed for 30 seconds 
and Jesus lives in near total obscurity for 30 years. We think we're special and we want somebody to know about it. Jesus lived in such a way that nobody could know about it until it was time. What a lesson for us to imitate Christ in his humility. He lives the quiet life of responsibility and godliness year after year for 30 years. All the while growing, all the while preparing, all the while being nourished in the word of God, in communion with God, until the day he would take his public stand. This is the God-man, fully God, fully man, our Savior, our Lord. This short narrative of the boy Jesus at 12 years of age, it does give us a clear glimpse, I hope, into his humanity, into what he hungered for, and into his humility. We, we see things about our Savior, even at this early age, and they draw out our affections to him. I love this 12-year-old boy. His perfections, whether at 12 sitting in the temple or 33 hanging upon the cross, his perfections stir up our affections. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Let's pray. Father, it, it is just remarkable to consider this treasured picture that you have given us in the Gospel of Luke. To know this single account of the Lord Jesus in his boyhood years. Lord, it is stirring, it is, it is rewarding, it is helpful, it is challenging, it is insightful. We thank you for this text of Scripture, the gift that it is to the church. And I pray that we would comprehend together the vast love of God in Jesus Christ. That you would write this account on our hearts and that we would be molded and conformed into the image of this Son, the Lord Jesus. Help us, draw near to us, cleanse away the rot and grime that would cloud or hinder us from running to you today. Save us, O Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.